Welcome to our morning worship for today, the first Sunday after Trinity. My name is Stephen Linstead. I am a reader in this parish. The sermon will be preached by Chris Carrington, who is also a reader in this parish, and the prayers will be led by his wife, Jenny. We look forward to the day, hopefully soon, when we are once more able to meet together in church to celebrate the Eucharist in person. Meanwhile, we bring you from our website, this office, the Ministry of the Word, followed by an act of spiritual communion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. We say together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we prepare to celebrate the presence of Christ, let us call to mind and confess our sins. And we say together, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Grant we beseech you, merciful Lord, to your faithful people, pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. The Collect for the Sunday after Trinity. O God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace, that in the keeping of your commandments, we may please you both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen.
Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers to his harvest. And Jesus summoned the twelve disciples and gave them authority over clean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment. Give without payment. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Good morning. I wonder if you enjoy gardening. Some of you will know that I'm a, a very enthusiastic but not a very good gardener. I really enjoy spending time in the garden, although it's very demanding on time and energy and often hard work with watering, especially when there's been such, in the past, a lack of, of good rainfall. I particularly enjoy uh, growing my own fruit and vegetables from seed to growth and then enjoying the harvest of the crops. There are times though that um, the harvest is so abundant that Jane, my wife, uh, sighs when I bring in another armful of uh, runner beans or a, uh, a bowl full of berries to be prepared or frozen. But they need to be picked or they will die and go to waste and no new growth and produce will come. I'm sure you are aware there's a real problem for our farmers in the UK at this present time. The harvest is there or is coming, but there's no one available to pick the crops in our fields or our polytunnels. This is, of course, uh, due in the large part to the coronavirus epidemic, but also to labourers coming from the European Union. In previous years, I understand that only 1% of the produce that was picked and packed in the UK was by UK citizens. It was announced the other week by the Environmental Secretary that the campaign entitled Pick for Britain was to be launched and to encourage people to sign up to help to bring in the harvest. Otherwise there would be a shortage and the harvest would rot and perish in the fields. To date, I understand the response has not been too great for our volunteers to be labourers. Perhaps no one uh, likes the hard work that it involves and getting their hands dirty. Uh, we would prefer to pick our fruit and vegetables from the shelves in Waitrose and Sainsbury's, all nicely cleaned, prepared and packed, uh, but not in plastic, of course. Jesus knew the importance 
of picking the crops at the right time and the dangers of a good harvest going simply to waste. And we look, when he looked at the crowds of people before him, he says to his disciples in verse 37, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. So why did Jesus make such a remark? Well, this section of Matthew's Gospel follows on from an amazingly busy time in Jesus' ministry. Just in chapter 9 of Matthew's Gospel, uh, he includes Jesus healing a paralysed man, restoring to life the daughter of a synagogue ruler, healing a woman with a discharge of blood, restoring the sight of two blind men, and casting out an evil spirit, and giving the man back his speech. Matthew summarises ministry in verse 35 when he records Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and sickness. Jesus looked and saw so much need. As he looked we read he was moved with compassion. This wasn't just a crowd to him. Each person mattered. Each one was loved by God and was in a lost state with nowhere to go and no one to help them. The word Matthew uses for compassion here is the strongest possible word. It's a pity which moves someone to the very depths of their being. Such was the love Jesus had for the people and continues to have for us today. Jesus speaks using illustrations from the world that they knew and gives to them and to us two pictures from the farming. Firstly, a neglected flock of sheep and secondly, a harvest going to waste for lack of those prepared to bring it in. The image of the shepherd and the sheep is one, of course, very familiar to us. We thought about how Jesus was the good shepherd a few weeks ago, and Simon the archdeacon reminded us of the close relationship that would have existed between the shepherd and his sheep. He would know each by name. He would protect and he would lead them. The image of the sheep is also common to the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 100 today says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Also the prophet Elijah, eh, sorry Ezekiel, <laughs> prophesies at length of the sheep of Israel with no sheep to look after them and is condemning of those who would only care for themselves and not for the sheep that they had responsibility for. Ezekiel calls them false shepherds. Nothing it seems has changed and as Jesus looks he sees the common people with no one to care for them, no one to lead them, no one to protect them. They're abandoned to wander and to fend for themselves. The Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders were chosen to be shepherds to bring help and strength in difficult times but it seems they cared for themselves only unwilling to engage with the common people more concerned with the subtle arguments over the interpretation of the law they saw people as chaff only to be burnt up jesus saw them as a harvest to be reaped and to be saved they, in their arrogance and pride, looked only for the destruction of the sinners. Jesus, out of love, died for the salvation of the sinners. The sheep were helpless and without direction. 
and no one who cared for them. Jesus now says to the disciples that these same people are like a plentiful harvest, waiting to be gathered in, but with no labourers to do it. Jesus saw the greatness of human need, not, not as a problem, but as an opportunity, a harvest of plenty. A good harvest of crops in the fields and in our gardens is indeed a wonderful thing. The hard work of sowing, feeding, watering the crops is past. It only needs to be picked or it will go to waste and perish. Notice Jesus says we are to pray to the Lord of the harvest for labourers into his harvest. Yes, yes, it's his harvest that we are called to labour in. God has prepared the lives of those he's chosen, but he needs labourers, you and me, to go and tell the good news of God's love in Jesus. We are not responsible for the growth of the kingdom. He is, as he seeks our cooperation in, in praying and going. We must be prepared to, to share in answering our own prayers. And like Isaiah, say, Lord, here am I, send me. I wonder what we see when we look with the eyes of compassion at those around us. As we queue in the supermarkets, as we pass people in the streets, and our schedule from tomorrow as we again are free to visit and go about our lives with a little more freedom although of course keeping good social distance. What sort of world are we coming back to, I wonder? How does God see those who as yet don't know his love for them? Jesus sees the hearts of those lost and looking for meaning, for meaning to life, and is looking for those who will labour for his kingdom to pray and to share their faith through works and in words of witness. The disciples were called to pray for labourers for the harvest, and we need, of course, to pray with faith for those who are on our front line in leadership and evangelism. Yes, without prayer, we know little of lasting value can be achieved. Prayer was at the centre of Jesus' ministry, and it must be ours too. But if the apostles that Jesus went on to choose, and we, think that prayer is all that is asked of us, then we need to think again. There will of course be those, for various reasons, who are limited in any potential to meet people. But for most of us, that isn't the case. Although this time of enforced isolation should be a time of reflection, prayer and preparation. We know only too well that God will answer our prayers, often by asking us to be the ones to go, to be the hands of Jesus, his feet, to bring words of consolation, hope and good news. Jesus the man was unable to accomplish in his short life and ministry all that was needed and he knew that he needed others who would work with him to minister powered by his spirit to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom. Jesus sends us out with the resources to do the work he has asked of us. The twelve whom we read were chosen as apostles are now immediately sent out by Jesus Notice carefully that their ministry was presented as parallel to his own, namely to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. They go, I'm sure, with a great deal of fear and trepidation. But they go with the authority and power to do the labourer's work. We too, as we remembered at Pentecost, as his church, are given all authority by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit 
to bring new disciples into his kingdom. Jesus later in the chapter warns them that it won't be easy. It wasn't easy for him and it won't be easy for us either. But it will come with its rewards. We will see some accept the salvation that God offers and know that by his spirit he will help us in our weakness as we struggle to put into words what our relationship with him means for us and can be for them. We are of course restricted at this time of the pandemic, pandemic in our ability to meet with people face to face, not even able to meet together in worship. However, I think we shall come back to a very different society when this is all over. And my prayer is that the harvest will be there as men and women look for meaning and answers to life. They know that material possessions are not the answer to fulfilment and to true happiness. And that so much of life is outside of our control. Life, we have been reminded, is uncertain and fear and sorrow and mourning need to be acknowledged. It's been really encouraging to see such sacrificial giving in the NHS and others in care homes and those working in essential services. Little could we have foreseen as we planned in Summerhill Parish for our 800 acts of kindness, that we would see the fruit of the Spirit in such kindness in our communities during this time. Jesus reminds the apostles, you received without paying, so give without pay. We too have received so much, are called to give of our whole selves to him in grateful service. So let's look for ways, new ways, to show God's love in Christ to a world which is seeking meaning and purpose. The harvest fields are plentiful, so let's pray and work to bring in the harvest for the Lord of the harvest. I close, come to a close with a quote on the website for Pick for Britain. It's actually from the President of the National Farmers Union. It is imperative that we inspire people to get involved with this harvest. I think Jesus would say very much the same for us too. How will you and I respond to his call for prayer and for action? I'm sure there is someone for each one of us who we could and we must introduce to Jesus. So let's each ask God for wisdom to know who we should be praying for regularly and pray for the opportunities to share something of God's love in Christ with them. Maybe, just possibly, our prayers for this season need to be that God would again open our eyes to see his world as he sees it, that we would love those he loves and created, that we would notice the sheep on our doorstep and being courageous in sharing God's love where we are in the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the good news of your kingdom. Forgive us when success, comfort and apathy make us forget that as your disciples we are called to share the knowledge of your love with our friends and neighbours, with a world that is suffering. We pray for areas of our world where there is unrest, violence or political tension, and for the many countries where the challenges of coronavirus are so much greater than here. We particularly remember the people of Malawi, 
with which our diocese is linked, as they struggle with political unrest and the worst food crisis in a decade, as well as the pandemic. Please bless the work of charities such as Christian Aid as they seek to bring relief and support and make us particularly generous in our giving and our prayers at this time that is so challenging for all charities. We pray for our government and all those in positions of leadership. Give them wisdom and integrity and guide all those responsible for the vital decisions and communications that affect the lives of us all. May the church, your people, be humble, seek you and pray faithfully for our nation at this time of crisis. We pray for church leaders, both nationally and locally. May they respond creatively and sensitively to the opportunities that may open up in these difficult times. Thank you for the hard work of so many in this parish. We pray for guidance in how to keep in contact with the many individuals and families on the fringe of our churches. Lord, we long for the message of your love to be shared throughout our community. Give us wisdom, courage, perseverance and a real dependence on you that we may be faithful in responding to your command to us, your disciples, to pray and to bring in the harvest. We pray for those for whom this is a particularly difficult time because of bereavement, illness, loneliness, job or money worries, or fear for their families. God of compassion, be close to those who are ill, afraid or in isolation. Please give skill, sympathy and resilience to all who are caring for the sick and your wisdom to those searching for a cure. We lift to you those who are particularly on our hearts this morning in a moment of silence. We close our prayers by saying together the words of the Lord's Prayer and then the leading your church into growth prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God of mission, who alone brings growth to your church, send your Holy Spirit to give vision to our planning, wisdom to our actions and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in numbers, in spiritual commitment to you, and in service to our local community. We bring all our prayers to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now that we have heard the word of God and offered our prayers for others as well as ourselves, let us seek to put ourselves at peace with God and with one another. Peace to this house from God, our Heavenly Father. Peace to this house from his Son, who is our peace. Peace to this house from the Holy Spirit, the life giver. And now, although the Eucharist and other public worship remain suspended, let us offer to God that praise and thanksgiving which previously we have offered in church. And let us contemplate in our hearts the mystery of the Lord's Supper and all the spiritual blessings that it brings to us. 
Before we do so, let us keep silence for a few moments as we prepare for our act of spiritual communion. Almighty God, in union with the faithful at every table of your church, from which your blessed body and blood are being partaken, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I present to you my soul and body, with the earnest wish that I may ever be united to you. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you and embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Let nothing ever separate me from you. Let me live and die in your love. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, grant that as the hem of your garment touched in faith, heal the woman who could not touch your body. So the soul of your servant may be healed by faith in you, whom I cannot now sacramentally receive. For your tender mercy, who lives and reigns with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. And so we conclude by seeking God's blessing on ourselves and those whom we love. May God, the holy and undivided Trinity, preserve us in body, mind and spirit, and bring us safe to that heavenly country where peace and harmony reign. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among us and remain with us always. Amen. <laughs>